understand what's really happening today. It's impossible to do it without a grasp for the historical context. And it even goes back before World War II. This really goes back to the World War I period, which is almost never talked about anymore. The Ottoman Empire controlled that part of the world, and it wasn't divided into nation states. There weren't all these artificial boundaries. It was the Arab world under the Ottoman Empire. What happened when the Ottoman Empire collapsed because of European desires to see the Ottoman Empire collapse was a takeover of the Middle East by European interests and then by the United States. And that's when these boundaries, many of which are artificial, many of which have no real relevance to the historical situation in the Middle East, came into play. For instance, take the boundary between Kuwait and Iraq, which brought us to the war in 91. The, the reality is that Kuwait is the 19th province of Iraq. Now whether that justifies Saddam's policies or whether that justifies uh, the royal family, the emir, um, that isn't the point. The point is that the people in that part of the world see a connection between Iraq and Kuwait which is not irrelevant to them. And uh, we in the West like to say that these boundaries and these countries must be established the way they are because that's the way we want them to be. In reality, in many cases, the legitimacy is highly questioned, which brings us to Palestine, Israel in the 40s. In the 30s and 40s, the Zionist movement was growing, but all was said to the Arabs, we do not intend to displace you, we do not intend to set up an independent Jewish state, we want to live in peace and brotherhood with you, but we must bring the refugees and the European Jews who want to come to live here uh, to this place, which was then called, everybody called it, Palestine. The British at the time were the administering agents, which went back to the, to the mandate of the League of Nations. Um, and the British played it both ways. On the one hand, they helped the Zionist movement. On the other hand, they said they were helping the Arabs. The reason they said that was they wanted both parties to look to Britain for legitimacy and for support. But after World War II, the situation changed. The British were an exhausted empire. They were unable to handle the uh, administration of the Palestine region. So what happened at that point was essentially a civil war broke out between the Jewish community, which then had the terrible onus of the Holocaust on its shoulders and bringing the straggling refugees from Europe. Uh, had I been alive at the time, I'm sure I would have been involved in helping bring destitute European Jews to Palestine. But why were they coming to Palestine? They were coming to Palestine because nobody else in the world would take them. They were coming to Palestine because the United States and Britain and everybody else had closed the doors to these refugees and had said to the Arabs, you take these refugees. We're going to dump them all on your shoulders. So if you realize that it was a civil war that broke out in Palestine in the mid-1940s, right after World War II, and we are still living with the ramifications of that civil war. All that's taking place today in terms of the occupied territories, in terms of making deals between the PLO and Israel, in terms of who has administration here versus who has administration there, that's because this is really one country whether you call it the Holy Land, whether you call it Palestine, even whether you call it Israel, it doesn't really change the reality that this is one geographic entity that has many claims placed on it. The claim of Zionism, uh, which grew much stronger in the post-World War II world after the Holocaust. The claim of Arab nationalism, which had been put under by the Ottomans, had been pushed under by the British, now was pushed under by the Zionists and the Americans. So I think I've exhausted the couple of minutes you gave me, um, but it's so important to understand this context because if you then see today's events uh, within the larger dynamic of how we got to today's events, it's much easier to understand why the various groups are fighting in the various ways, um, not having given up struggles that we in the West kind of say they should have given up, but it's really not for us. to Hamas, for instance, let me just take a minute on Hamas. Hamas is not a bunch of crazy Arab radicals killing Jews and refusing peace agreements. Hamas is a legitimate expression of Islamic national interests that goes back 
a long, long time into the Ottoman period, in fact. And uh, they refuse what they consider to be an agreement with sub which subjugates them, which places them on reservations, which puts them in a Bantustan situation, which leaves the Israeli empire thriving and vibrant, and is supposed to then have Palestinian police, or as the Chicago Tribune uh, a few days ago said, Palestinian cops, taking care of them. Now, I don't share anything theologically with the people in Hamas. I have met some of them by accident on the many trips that I've taken, over a hundred trips to Israel and Palestine in the last 15 years. I find them very dignified people, very thoughtful people, people very aware of their history and their heritage, people fighting for their self-determination, for their freedom, for their dignity, just as other people in other parts of the world fight for theirs. But here in the United States especially, we cast them as uh, crazies and terrorists and renegades and killers. You know, we actually do to them the same thing that we did for 20 years to the PLO. And it's time to get beyond all these stereotypes and under the, understand that people have legitimate grievances that they're fighting for. And these legitimate grievances have to all be dealt with if our goal is a stable and just peace. The current agreement, the agreement that was signed in Washington and then in Cairo, you know, those who are in power uh, tend to represent things as breakthroughs, as significant uh, historic events. They want credit for these events, of course. That's the nature of politicians. But the nature of independent analysts and the nature of people who don't have a political axe to grind uh, should be different. They should be to say what is really happening as opposed to what we're told is happening. This agreement has been in the process for 15 or 20 years. The Israeli Labor Party has always been committed to what it has called the Alone Plan. The Alone Plan ha was uh, named after Foreign Minister Alone in the 60s, I believe, that the population centers of the Palestinian areas should be taken over by Palestinians in the context of Jordanian sovereignty. But the resources and the land and the security aspects of all this territory should be left under Israeli domination. Now, the Israelis tried for a long time to find Palestinians who would cooperate with their vision of what Palestine should be. They set up village leagues, which didn't work. They held elections, which didn't work. They tried this, they tried that. All right. Then the Intifada broke out uh, seven years ago, this uprising for independence. Up until then, there had always been a sort of a low-grade Intifada. There had never been an acceptance by the Palestinians of Israeli occupation. And that occupation, by the way, is extremely brutal. We're not talking about the fact that the Israeli army is just there, you know, uh, policing traffic. The Israeli army is involved in terrible forms of torture, terrible forms of repression, terrible forms of intimidation, and has been for a, for a very long time. Outrageous uh, uh, in terms of what the uh, Israelis say they stand for. And that's why American Jews like myself have been uh, so impelled to speak up against it. When the Intifada broke out, there was a need somehow uh, for public relations reasons and also because Israelis were being killed and the rebellion was causing Israel a great deal of heartache. There was a need to do something about it. But the Israelis couldn't find any way to do it. Then there was a major change which the, with the Gulf War. The Gulf War for the first time brought the United States front and center into the Middle East. It made it clear that the client regimes in the major countries were not popularly based regimes, but were regimes kept in power because the United States kept them there. The Gulf War, in a sense, changed the whole configuration. On top of that, the Cold War ended. So you no longer had the Arab states playing the Soviet Union off against the United States. In the last couple years, 
the American government has been saying to the Israeli government, you've got to do something. There's just too much upheaval, too much protest. Not to mention that the Arab regimes are telling us that this is tremendously harming their own legitimacy and causing the possibility of uh, tension and revolution in their own societies. Now, we, the United States government, do not want to see revolution in these countries which, by the way, really means democracy in these countries because all of these countries are held in bondage by regimes that were placed there either by the British or by ourselves, none of which have any popular legitimacy and all of which are involved in forms of intimidation and repression of their own population. The Saudi regime, uh, the regime in Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, uh, police states like Syria, military police states like Egypt, what's happening in Algeria where you had a fundamentalist revolution that tried to come to power through elections and then the military with the help of the American CIA called the elections off so finally the PLO was on its deathbed Yasser Arafat's PLO had disintegrated his legitimacy had been undermined by Hamas which has more popular support in Palestine than does his PLO his financing had been cut off by the Arab regimes which were now indebted to the United States for having saved the status quo in the Gulf and having destroyed the Iraqi army and returned the Emir to his throne in Kuwait. The PLO uh, essentially had been defeated which is what the Israelis and the Americans had been attempting to do for a great long time. Well. On the other hand, the Israelis needed somebody to deal with. They needed some Palestinian entity to try to create um, this police force situation with. Well, they tried to negotiate with the team from the occupied territories, but the team from the occupied territories was unwilling to sign the deals that the Israelis wanted to offer them. Then they found that their only option was to get Yasser Arafat to sign these deals. Now, why did he sign them? Arafat had always said he wouldn't. Arafat had ordered the negotiating team never to sign those kinds of deals. But when he was faced with his own loss of power and the total collapse of the PLO, and he was literally within weeks or months of that, he had no funds, there was rebellion in the ranks, there had been defections from the leadership of the PLO, Arafat obviously decided that he was going to choose personal survival over institutional policies. And he agreed that he, in a sense, would become governor of the occupied territories on behalf of the, call it if you will, to give it a name, the imperial power, the hegemonic power, which would be Israel backed by the United States. I suspect, you know, if he were here uh, commenting, and I know Yasser Arafat and have had dinner with him a number of times, met him a number of times, he would say, this is the best we could do. This, we're defeated people, we're vanquished people, this is the best we could do. Um, and he would say, we're still hoping for a Palestinian state, we're still planning to move ahead, and we expect more to come of this. But that's not very likely. The Palestinians have given up their trump cards. The Arab world is a defeated world politically. You can think of the agreement that has just been made. Think of it in these terms. In 67, the Arab world was defeated militarily on the battlefield. In the 90s, Arab nationalism, Palestinian nationalism, has been defeated diplomatically at the negotiating table. And that's why you see so much tension within the Palestinian community. That's why even the negotiators who Arafat sent to Washington and to negotiate with the Israelis did not come to the ceremony at Washington or in Cairo. Uh, the American press doesn't tell these things very uh, easily, but uh, the majority of the negotiators were not in Cairo, I know that for sure. Um, and at least the head of the negotiating team, Dr. Abdul Shafi, refused to come to the ceremony in Washington. So you have an agreement, but the agreement contains within it its own destructive tendencies, if not its own undoing. The Israelis, I believe, think they win either way. The Israelis think that if the police force really does its job, and our settlements can stay, and we can turn over administrative duties to the Palestinians, and they will police their own areas,
uh, without our having to give up sovereignty over these areas and without their claiming independence in these areas, then that's wonderful. Um, we Israelis have accomplished a, a great goal. We are in charge, but they maintain, they take care of their day-to-day -day affairs. It's more likely, I think, that there will be civil war, tension, violence, in which case maybe even Yasser Arafat won't be with us. Uh, in that case, the Israelis say to the world, what more can we do? We tried so hard. We even negotiated with the PLO. We even made this agreement, you know, to work with the Palestinian people. In which case, many people in the world, not familiar with the uh, intricacies of the history of this problem and the regional and political dynamics of this problem, many people will also throw up their hands and say, well, you know, what more can we do about this problem? Well, the answer really is quite uh, simple. All these years, what many people have been saying is that if you want a just peace, that just peace has to give legitimate fulfillment to the aspirations of the people who are in conflict. In the context of Israel and the Palestinians, that means at minimum two sovereign independent states. Not one state dominating over the other, not one state promoting a peace police force that represents a, a faction of the other, but two states, two nationalisms, two historic fulfillments, both claiming all of historic Palestine, but each at least given the attributes of its independence and national dignity um, lacking being able to have control of the entire area. That's not what this agreement is about. That's what the agreement many of us have been advocating would be about. In fact, the, the current agreement is uh, designed to make sure that the other kind of agreement doesn't come into play. But there's one more crucial element to this, if I may, and that's the very nature of the regimes in the region. What the Americans and the Israelis are trying to do with this agreement is essentially to create one more Arab client state. That means they're trying to convert the PLO of Yasser Arafat, a faction of the current Palestinian movement, into the client regime that does our bidding, accepts our funding, is dependent on us, meaning the United States and the West, for its legitimacy and for its survival. Now, having done that successfully in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, with the Hashemite government of uh, Jordan, having failed in Iran, but then again, there were all those years where we did have a client regime, the Shah of Iran. We all forget that they were the linchpin of stability in the Gulf not that long ago. We also tried it in Iraq. There was a monarch from the Hashemite clan that was installed by the British with American backing in the 50s in Baghdad. A revolution uh, pushed that regime out. So what is really going on here, think of it in these terms, is that the Americans and the Israelis took the shell of the PLO, bankrupt, defeated, destitute, nowhere to go, and offered that shell, you become our client regime in Palestine. We will then supply you with used trucks and military equipment. We will supply you with funds to pay your soldiers. We will supply you with covert intelligence capabilities so you can monitor what the other groups are doing, just like we do for the Saudis and the Hashemites and others in the region. We certainly have uh, been doing this for the Egyptians ever since Camp David was signed. You in return must agree to give up the struggle, must agree to police yourselves, must agree uh, not to cause the Israelis difficulties and must agree in a sense to accept American-Israeli domination of regional affairs. Now, if you put it in those terms, it becomes a lot easier to understand why self-respecting and dignified Palestinians don't find that arrangement uh, a very desirable one. Their fight has not been over whether they could have a few crumbs of uh, self-rule or autonomy.
their fight has been over independence and sovereignty. Their fight has been over a Middle East where Israel wasn't the only nuclear superpower always threatening uh, to take out Arab capitals if there should be another war. Their fight is over a culture and a way of life that is grounded in the Islamic traditions that they know not in Western traditions with prime ministers and kings that come out of armies that are trained um, in American uh, camps or uh, prime ministers who were trained at British or American universities. They want legitimate expressions of their own culture and their own civilization, which by the way is a very rich and very deep civilization, which uh, you go back to another time in history uh, was far advanced over the European civilization. But that time is certainly gone for the present. One little story, if I may. About three years ago, I was in Saudi Arabia. And it was an unplanned meeting, very late at night, that I'd been asked to come to, um, about one o'clock in the morning, actually. A room full of Saudi intellectuals. And the discussion began. They weren't aware that I was coming to their weekly meeting. I'd been invited by a newspaper to give a talk that night and then invited after to this meeting. The discussion went on. The war was in its early stages. The Americans were building up forces to attack Iraq. And I said, you know, similar things to what's, what have been said in this interview. And across the room, a man I never met and still don't know uh, hadn't said a word all night. I'd been there for maybe an hour. The man looks up at one point, he's smoking uh, his pipe, and the moment he starts speaking, perfect English, I learned later he'd been educated in the States, and he simply said the following, he said, Mr. Brzezinski, you know, it's our great pleasure that you've come with, to be with us this evening, and please, on the other, please allow me to only correct one thing that you've said. I expected all hell to break loose. I thought this was the polite Arab way of saying, okay, now let me tell you something. And all he said was, he didn't mention a word about Iraq, the war, regimes. All he said was, Mr. Brzezinski, this evening, a number of times I have heard this word dignity, and you have used this word. You will go home in a few days, and let me tell you one thing that you should remember. This word dignity of which you have spoken, this word no longer can be found in the dictionary of the Arabs. And I thought it was just a masterful summary that without saying anything quotable about the current issues of the day, he had said everything. And that's in the end what these fights from Algeria to the streets of Cairo to the camps of Palestine, that's what this is all about dignity, uh, assertion of one's own culture, one's own values, one's own self-determination. And that's what our revolution was about. Why did we have the Boston Tea Party? Why didn't we like the redcoats running around in our streets? Because we wanted our own dignity. We wanted to rule ourselves. We wanted our own cu new culture that wasn't the British culture. It was the American culture to be dominant. We didn't want to have, like the Canadians accepted to have, the Queen of England as the Queen or King of America. We wanted to have the United States of America. And that's why the Arab world is in turmoil. Because to go back to the history part, after World War I they were promised independence. Not independence as a little entity here, a little entity here with false borders, this one ruled by France, this one ruled by England. But independence as the Arab world. Now that desire for independence was stolen from them by the 1918 conference in Paris, the peace conference, where the famous Lawrence of Arabia was there and uh, Emir Faisal was there. And it, in those years, the whole idea of Arab sovereignty, Arab independence, a United States of Arabia, if you want to think of it in that way, that was taken from them. Instead, they ended up with mandates carved into borders that had no historical legitimacy um, other than the fact that Britain wanted its peace, France wanted its peace, and others were interested in other pieces.
the Americans came in after World War II and betrayed this system that had been created by the Europeans. We did so because we were the surviving great power after World War II. The British and the French had lost their empires. And what do we get for it? What we get for it is cheap oil prices, so that our economy can live at an artificially high standard of living. We get plentiful oil at cheap oil prices from the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, and others. We get petrodollars that flow back to American banks rather than get invested in Arab institutions. The deal is actually pretty simple. We help keep those regimes in power, which also means we help them repress their own people and we help them fight against the democratic、uh, and Islamic trends within their own cultures. And in return、uh, for that, we get. Lots of oil at very low prices. We get AT&T to go build the biggest contract ever for telecommunication systems in Arabia. We get Boeing airplanes sold in the billions of dollars、uh, to the Gulf countries instead of、uh, other countries getting their airplanes sold there, and at a price. Which is difficult to explain, but the price is the price of independence, dignity, self-determination for the peoples who live there. And maybe with this kind of an explanation, it's a little easier for Americans to understand why all the turmoil, why all the hatred, why all the bombs, why all the guns. Not to mention the World Trade Tower and other things that、uh, still may happen in our country.